Thank you and good morning. We've just heard about changing energy flows, overcapacity, and regulation, and that it's still the bankers' fault. Good to know some things don't change. These themes are a good starting point for the two defining changes that I'd like to touch on, namely the rise of state capitalism and the critical juncture we've reached on environmental sustainability. What do I mean by state capitalism? The changing pattern of energy supply and demand is leading once again to increased government involvement in the energy supply chain. We see nations reaching into Africa, laying claim to islands in the middle of the ocean, planting flags under the North Pole, buying fields and building fleets. In addition, domestic economic pressures are leading to protectionist measures in the name of job creation, sometimes in the traditional manner of tariffs, but also in new ways such as pushing local content and underwriting the expansion of assets. You know which countries I'm talking about. It's not always the obvious ones and the list is getting longer. From a purely national perspective, it may seem reasonable to build up local industry. But on a global basis, this works against the theory of comparative advantage, it adds cost, and it results in excess capacity. Now before this sounds like I'm blaming governments for overcapacity and shipping, we should look in the mirror. As the Financial Times wrote two weeks ago, overcapacity and weak demand, what would you do? Cutting supply would seem obvious, but shipping lines prefer, it appears, to add it. Unless the industry as a whole does something about cutting capacity, profits will stay weak at best. And as Maruka-san said earlier, while there are rational reasons why an individual company orders new ships rather than buying existing ones, everyone doing the same thing results in collective madness. This is all relevant to the question of sustainability. Whatever the cause of excess capacity, government involvement or self-inflicted damage, it takes pricing down to levels that bear no relation to the economic cost of providing that service, let alone the environmental cost. Earlier this year, one could ship two million barrels of crude oil from the Middle East to the US for zero marginal cost, nothing more than the fuel to get it there. And there is ample evidence to show that people will not use a resource thoughtfully when it's provided for free. Another danger of excess capacity and zero pricing is that it forces people to cut corners and the risk of incidents go up. We've seen this time and again. And linking sustainability back to energy supply, even if we find enough new sources to satisfy growing demand, we are going to continue on our collision course with the elements. Forget two degree temperature rises, we're now heading for six with massive consequences. As the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu wisely said, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. <laughs> I could spend more time defining the challenges we face, but in the interest of time, let me turn to solutions. What can we do? Well, as companies, the first step is to look aggressively for efficiencies in our own business. At BW, we're working on multiple fronts to have our ships consume less energy, and we're collaborating with peers on this. To mention just two projects, BW, together with Willemsen, Grieg, Klavenis, Solvang, as Working Group 5, and with NTNU, Kongsberg, Marintech, and Marorca in one project, which is called Energy Management in Practice. And BW is working with DNV, NTNU, and Wetzler in another project called Harvesting, Recovery, and Storage. A second consideration is to keep slow steaming in view. I know it's already a norm and that our customers don't always agree to slow down on the laden leg, but it's amazing how many ships are still running at much higher speeds than is necessary or economic. Third, in terms of ship design, it was great to see the new ship designs earlier this morning and we need to keep driving this forwards. Some of the newly touted eco-ships being marketed lack the substantive changes visible in those examples we saw and may not be the answer to our challenges. Scrapping young ships 
is a huge environmental waste. And we should not be, and we should be spending at least as much energy on optimizing existing ships. With new emission regulations, uncertainty over the price of fuel, and the possible switch to gas propulsion in future, we need to make sure that today's eco-ship does not look like tomorrow's oil-thirsty dinosaur. Fourth, we need to actively support new technologies that address sustainability. At BW, we are not only adopting new technologies, but actively investing and incubating promising new ideas. We have a team called Green Marine Capital working full-time to find the right ideas. We've screened over 200 companies in the past 24 months, and we've invested in six. We're well-placed to provide not only capital, but also management support. And by applying the technologies to our own fleet, we can underwrite our own return on investment. If you have good ideas, or if you'd like to join us, please let us know. Turning to regulators, my earlier skepticism about government involvement in business is reversed when it comes to regulation. Governments have a critical role to play establishing the rules of the road, and as we heard earlier, ensuring a level playing field. Some thoughts on this. First, introduce legislation at a measured and steady pace. Just as damaging as rushed legislation is stop-start legislation, which makes it very difficult to progress solutions because no one knows where they stand. An example of this is ballast water treatment, where the failure to ratify in a timely manner leaves the industry in limbo, creates an uneven playing field, and slows down innovation. So on this front, I question the suggestion that we should modify the introduction of legislation according to market ups and downs. Second, ensure that we take steps to include the environmental cost in the price of fuel. It may sound counterintuitive to argue for taxes on bunker fuel during a shipping downturn, but I think this is manageable if the following conditions are met. It should be applied equally across the industry. It should be at a flat rate per tonne of fuel rather than a volatile market-based instrument. And it should start at a low level with clear and meaningful increases over a 10-year period. The proceeds should be reinvested into environmental initiatives within our own industry to incentivize green recycling and develop new technologies and solutions. Third, ensure that systems are kept simple enough to be effective. Measuring, reporting, and verifying CO2 according to a complex energy efficiency operational index, even just saying it is hard, is far harder than using simple bunker delivery notes. Of course, there's scope for cheating there too, but it's easier to manage. As one wise man said, simplicity equals hard work. Complexity equals no work at all. This is another area where we're working with DNV and five peers to find solutions. And finally, governments should resist the short-term fix of state-sponsored capitalism, which may feel good in the short term, but creates overcapacity and overprotected, uncompetitive businesses in the long run. Change is upon us and presents us with opportunities as well as responsibilities. As companies, we need to do our part. Government needs to create new rules with implementation that is measured, uniform, and predictable. And we should all work in parallel for free trade and open markets. I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.